Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Live, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Okay, well, I was thinking about doing a review tonight, and then something happened over the weekend, as it often does to change what I think maybe I'm doing. And that was, there was an article about a uh, church shooting in Russia, I might add, Russia, and I wanted to sort of track that sucker down a little bit because I noticed something odd on that uh, on the first place that I saw it. And it made me want to do something that I do for a hobby, believe it or not, which is attempt to track down where the original story came from and how much additional junk, just nonsense, that was never included in the story pops up and how that happens. I have been doing this for quite some time. It is why down here... I say, nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. When you've spent, I guess, about 25 years, as I have, just trying to find out where the original story came from and figuring out what this weird process is, where the press essentially just reverberates nonsense inside of its own little echo chamber. I got it down pretty good. I can usually find it. I'll say real quick, here, take a look at my chat. Hi, uh, Captain Jesse. Uh, oh, gosh, you know what you can't see on here? I'm going to have to move my mic. There, I, I have a new accoutrement that I've got on my uh, on my thing, but uh, I'm going to have to change where the mic position is in order for you to see it. Okay, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, I do have a new accoutrement. Anyway, uh, Marshall says, backup recording missing audio. That's odd. Well, I do have audio, so I appreciate you doing the backups, Marshall. So far, it hasn't been needed, but you know, who knows. Anyhow, yes, thank you. Actually, I took it off of my, it occurred to me, I can't really wear my real, you know, Starfleet original series costume anymore. And I probably never will. Um, this is just stuck onto it with tape, basically, and so I moved it around because, hey, why not? I'm really never going to be able to fit in that costume again. <laughs> Anyhow, I wanted to talk to you about the press and how the press works and how it is that basically everything that you see in the press is not real. Just nothing is real in the press. Yes, thank you very much. One of these years, I will have that laptop be able to do this simultaneously, and it will be cool. Uh, but until then, Marshall is being a very kind friend in doing this for me. Hi, Greg Q. How are you doing this evening? Well, I'll just throw up my other thing. So here is what um, I have found generally about the press and, and how they operate and how the echo chamber works. It seems to be pretty consistent anymore. And it takes me only a half hour or so to really kind of debunk, um, you know, 90% of what you're seeing in there, uh, if not more. <laughs> so um, I'm going to walk through that process. I'm going to, you know, explain to you how the press actually works here in the 21st century in terms of disseminating information and how you get it. And, um, you know, well, I'm, hopefully this will kind of be useful for you. As I say, I've been doing this for a quarter of a century, I guess. It's older than my oldest kid. So that means, oh man, you know, I don't even want to think about it, maybe closer to 30 years now. But in any case, I, I, I debunk the press for kicks. That's what I do for a bizarre, twisted, masochistic hobby, is I, uh, you know, I, I debunk the press for kicks. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through and debunk this story. Well, not debunk it so much, but move it around so that it makes a little more sense. Uh, geez, there's just no way I can put this. I'm going to have to redo this for tomorrow as so you can actually see it. Anyhow, um, I, that started out with a story that I saw in the uh, Daily Star in the UK about a uh, shooting at a church in one of the Russian Federation's uh, countries or territories. Or I'm not sure what they call them over there. Uh, let's see. It's fun to uh, do... Uh, uh, R.I.P. to press? Well, one would hope. One would hope. I'm kind of hoping by throwing this out here and showing you how I've made basically, you know with me, right, when I do my reviews, it's very structured. I have an outline that I actually follow because I used to be a college instructor from the place that shall not be named. And so I'm very, very careful about making sure I've, you know, got some structure to it. This has structure because I have watched it over a long period of time and it's pretty much the same. 
Um, yeah, I can't move it over here. That that would be wrong. No, but I can slide the mic over there. So <laughs> um, anyway, so how the press works here. Let me show you a little presentation that I've put together. This is nothing amazing because, hey, I'm not that good with video software. Fast with it really is a problem. So here is a little presentation I'm going to show you. Now, the first thing off, you have to say this is what my stance is. Nothing that you see in the press is real, and that's just absolutely nothing. Um, it never has been real, and it never will be real. It has not been real back when uh, the uh, scribes carved in the in names of the ancient pharaohs. That was not real about them, other than some of their basic facts. Mostly, it was just PR. And that's what the press has always been, is just PR. So here's how it works. We start out with what I call patient zero. Now, patient zero is the original person or, or place or blog or a news outlet that published the story. Now, patient year zero, if it is a news story like this one was with the uh, uh, church and the gunman in, the, uh, uh, in Russia, uh, there's usually some news outlet that's close to the story. I mean, physically close because they're the ones that can, you know, track things down. The problem is they don't actually track things down. Um, they have very few facts in reality. And when we get through to this, I will take you and show you exactly what little facts there were when I ran through this the first time. Which I did on Facebook, by the way. Uh, I tracked it all the way through. Certainly welcome to look there. My regular Facebook account is WRStone3. So uh, check that out if you want to. But it's basically a less structured way of telling you what I'm going to do here. So we have very few facts in any given story. Patient Zero does not do very, very much fact checking. That's not what they do today. They get the story out in any, at any consequence at all. So as a consequence, even local to the story, they get information that is inaccurately reported. This particular last thing is responsible for most of the 9-11 conspiracy theories. The inaccurate information that was reported by local press happening real time was astonishing, and it led to so much crap. I have to tell you, Remember this, boys and girls, even at patient zero, they're still kind of just making stuff up occasionally so they can get the story out, okay? So when you hear something at all in the press, for the, in the immediate term, you just say, okay, take with a grain of salt what is real in this. And I will show you how to determine what is real. So first, then after that, after patient, patient zero, you have what I would like to call press wave one. Now, these are typically government or well-known media outlets. By the way, I'm doing this, uh, I'm not doing a tape here, so feel free to ask questions if you want along the way. Um, these are uh, typically government or well-known uh, media outlets. Uh, audio capture restored, YouTube don't explode. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you get these, like I say, Press Wave 1 consists of generally well-known media outlets. TASS, for example, they were involved in this one. That's the Russian official Russian news service. The Times of London, the New York Times, the Washington Times, the Daily Planet, basically any place that you can think of as a great metropolitan newspaper is basically part of Press Wave 1. Sometimes it also does include uh, some other than print media, but in general, it tends to be print media or local uh, news sources. Now again, Press Wave 1 does not do any fact checking. They simply assume that all fact checking was performed by Patient Zero, and if you recall, Patient Zero didn't do any fact checking either to speak of. So on Wave 1, they sometimes add unsighted details that are not present in Patient Zero's report. And you have to track down where these came from if they came from anywhere. What you usually find is the details that were added by Press Wave 1 are typically inaccurate. So you have inaccurate information coming from Patient Zero and additional inaccurate information being added to it by Press Wave 1. Then you have Press Wave 2, and these are typically the large visual, uh, visual media outlets, like ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS if you're kind. CNN, NBC, Fox News, these guys don't do any fact checking. Okay. Their job is to get a new 
news story in front of that talking head anchor every 15 minutes. And if they don't, they'll be fired. So they don't fact check. They sometimes also add unsighted details that are not present in Wave 1's report. And these details are usually inaccurate or at least very questionable. So now we have inaccurate information being added by Wave 2 on top of the inaccurate information added by Wave 1 on top of the inaccurate information that was added by Patient Zero. And then Wave 2 starts quoting and requoting Press Wave 1 as proof that they have uh, a good story because all of Press Wave 1 has it. You know, when the Daily Planet has it, then Galaxy Broadcasting is going to use them as a source. But if the Daily Planet is no good as a source, then Galaxy Broadcasting has no decent news. So then we get Press Wave 3. Now, these are typically uh, local, regional media outlets like KCCI, which operates out of central Des Moines here. Uh, the Des Moines Register, which is the paper of record for uh, all of Iowa. Uh, KOLN and KLIN in Nebraska, for example, and the Minneapolis Star Tribune, just to name a few. They don't do any fact-checking. They sometimes add unsighted details that were not present in Press Wave 1 through 2's reports, and these are usually inaccurate. So now we have Wave 3 adding inaccurate information on top of Wave 2's inaccurate information, on top of Wave 1's inaccurate information, on top of Patient Zero's inaccurate, inaccurate information. And then we have Press Wave 4. These are usually talking heads, you know, like our talk show hosts, like Rush Limbaugh, Alex Jones, Bill Stone, any guests they may have. They don't do any fact-checking, with the exception of Bill Stone. And I'll tell you, I do, I try really hard to come on here with just facts and not overblown crap. Um, when I get ticked off, for example, the first thing I do is try to um, uh, sit back breathe for a while and then see if I can maybe look at the situation a little more dispassionately. But others, Rush Limbaugh, Alex Jones, Hannity, anyone you want to talk to, they don't do any fact checking. And then they start adding unsighted details not present in Press Wave 1 through 3's reports. They're typically inaccurate. The sole exception is Bill Stone because I will show you how I do this because I did it earlier this week. I will show you how I did this precisely so that you can see how we find out what little information there actually is on any given story. Do not do spell checking. Make up your good fact checking. Nobody's perfect. Hey, uh, I missed the spell checker. It was sitting there in uh, open office. I just missed it. Um, so, Press Wave 4 is now quoting and re-quoting Press Waves 1 through 3 as fact. They're using those press accounts that we know now are inaccurate and quoting them in order to bolster their own case. And what we get to by this time is just plain nonsense. Except for Bill Stone, of course. I quote and re-quote only those people that seem appropriate. Usually eyewitnesses. I do not re-quote other news articles except to maybe mention one like I'm going to today. So what we find here is we get this kind of blur of misinformation. So if you start in the middle there with patient zero, right? Well, that story's mostly true. And then when you get to press wave one, it's basically true. By press wave two, it's maybe a little bit true. And by Press Wave 4, 3, it's just nonsense. It's complete nonsense. There would be absolutely, there's so little fact involved that you have to do what I do, which is go backwards so far. And I'm going to show you that in the chain so you can find out where patient zero was and what patient zero actually said. And then how that jives with what was added on later. Anything uh, on Press Wave 4, you know, all those talk show hosts and all those morons, that's just beneath your dignity. Um, it doesn't, I mean, it's beyond nonsense. It's just beneath your dignity. <laughs> Don't do it. And as you can see here, we have a nice little thing that tells us you are here. You have to get to here if you want to know the story. And that involves going through all these layers. And again, I will show you. Uh, let's see, Captain Jesse asks, I'm going to go back to my uh, thing here. 
Let's go back and take a look at ch qu chat real quick. Uh, do not spell check. Yeah. Uh, why would Bill Stone need to spell check? <laughs> uh, do you, are you uh, William Blur? I'm not sure. Uh, some, hey, I ain't perfect. I ain't perfect at all. But I don't also pretend to be a full-time uh, journalist or something like that who's supposed to get stuff right. <laughs> Uh, just because we have people do judge when evaluating the quality of the info. Yes, oh, that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I'll tell you honestly what happened is I'm finding that I need to have more light on in order to see my big freaking screen here. And I wrote that at a time when it was just a little too dark. So I'll go back and fix it. Well, now it's stuck in the video. But he's absolutely right. It, uh, it, 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 it doesn't make it look as intelligent as it could. So... Uh, on the iron side of facts, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just the ripping apart of the press and seeing what the facts might be. So, in that same vein, uh, and I'm one of Bill's face fans. Well, thank you, Marshall. Uh, to do, he knows I had do this, make that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, hey, anybody wants to say anything one way or the other, even if it's tell you hate, tell me you hate me, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, you know, <laughs> anything you want to say. If it seems like it might make the show better, I'm all for it. Trust me. All right, so let's get into um, how I went about finding out how much of this story about Russia was actually nonsense. And um, here's, what, uh, here's what you have to keep in mind, what you're shooting for here. When going through this stuff, what you're shooting for is something like what Heinlein called a fair witness. Now, I'll just read you a quick definition of this out of Urban Dictionary, so we know it's real. Um, a fair witness is a fictional profession in the book Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein, the master himself. In the book, fair witnesses were individuals trained to see the world around them as literally as possible until second... Uh, and, until sensed by whomever it was otherwise. Okay, so another way to describe this, it'd be like if somebody uh, takes all things that are sensed as literal as possible and uh, have no reason to believe that what they just sensed will remain that way when they are no longer sensing them. And all we're talking about here in the senses is the standard five senses. This is not, we're not talking about extrasensory perception. We're just talking about looking at stuff and not making assumptions. Do not assume that the news comes from a critical source, a credible source, for example. Do not assume that any videos or pictures that you might see embedded in with a news article are actually from the event, or if they were, if they show what they purport to show in the article, because they are, they're different. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Um, an excerpt from um, Stranger in a Strange Land may make this a little more clear. Um, now, there was a point at which uh, Jubal, who's the main character here, uh, says to Jill, uh, even Cavendish did not, and we won't say, no, say so. You know how fair witnesses behave. And Jill said, well, no, I've never met one. And Jubal says to Jill, so Anne. Anne was the, on the springboard there in front of a uh, nice uh, pool that Jubal has. Uh, Anne was on the springboard. She turned to Jubal, uh, her head to Jubal, and Jubal called out, that house on the hilltop, can you see what color they've painted it? Anne looked, then answered, it's white on this side. Jubal went to Anne, said, went on to Anne, well, you see, it doesn't even occur to Anne to infer that the other side is white. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't force her to commit herself unless she went there and looked. And even then, she wouldn't assume it stayed that way after she looked. After she left, it could have stayed completely. So keep, try to keep that in mind. That's what we're shooting for. Now, nobody can do that. God knows I can't do that. I tend to see the world in libertarian uh, uh, perspectives, and so I have a worldview that makes it difficult. But that's what we're shooting for here. How much can we pull away from making any assumptions about any news article that we see? Because that is going to be vital to finding the actual news. You have to be able to pull away and say, maybe this isn't what it says. Maybe this is stock footage. Maybe this is something else. As opposed to just taking literally what they say that they're purporting to show. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ironside, do not... Uh, what we had... Uh, we uh, we, would that we had uh, fair witnesses? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I have no question. 
Now, what color is the, the barn? Fair witness would say it's painted white on this side. Yep, just like I said there from the uh, thing. We don't assume it's any different. Just because, we, you know, if we, we don't assume after, she, after you turn your head away from the barn, you do not even assume that it is still white at that time. The moment that you are not watching it, it could change at any time. And so that's kind of what we're shooting for when we do this thing with um, trying to get to the truth. Or the facts, I should say. Pretty much facts. Okay. This is going to be fun. I'm, uh, let me see if I can uh, get up my... Ah, it's right here. See, I did this... Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because I did it sort of uh, on the fly on Facebook. And so I have it nicely documented so I can walk through it without having to kill myself trying to remember. So what I started doing was this. So we have this story. First I had, to get specific, on my Android I use, uh, a, what is it? It's one of the uh, apps that uh, will keep your RSS feeds. And so it came across my RSS feed that there was this guy who opened fire on a church festival crowd with at least five dead. And it was Russia, so this kind of interested me because I was like, okay, well, we just had one of these things too. I wonder, because I've never actually tried to find out, I wonder how many kinds of crimes they have like that in Russia. So I saw this and I went, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, now, they have gunfire here at this church. I can't let you listen to it. I can't. Oh, I'm already pushing what my machine can do to get out. I can't, um, I can't do anything with this, but I will put a link, and I'm, I can't believe I forgot. I'll put a link to each of the places that we're going to go on the web to find out where the truth comes from. Um, so this uh, gunfire, you can listen to it yourself. Um, all I can say is there, what sound, there is what sounds like um, probably select fire. Uh, rifle of some kind. There are two or three shots. I can't remember how many. And then you hear something that is um, much more uh, powerful. Perhaps a rifle, perhaps a shotgun. It's hard to say. And then there are two uh, females who are speaking, I think Russian, but uh, if you go there and listen to it and it's not Russian, I'd be very curious to know what they're actually saying. Again, we're going to step back. We do not assume that just because they put this video on here that it's accurate. Who knows where it came from? We do not know. So all we can say is we're listening and watching the video and this is what we hear and hear uh, and that's all and see. And that's all we can say. We cannot say that this actually occurred at the church. We do not know that. We do not know where this came from. It is totally unsighted. It's simply there and says it is what it is. But we don't know that. A fair witness would not assume that that video is accurate simply because it is in a newspaper, which is what this is. This is the online version of a printed paper. Um, so I was just scrolling past this. I wasn't really paying much attention, and I got to this one. Now, if you're familiar with guns, this is quite clearly a shotgun. Uh, I, I'm not even sure it's double-barreled. It might be, but it's hard to tell there. There's clearly a, a shotgun shell lying here. Uh, and it said it was a shotgun. Okay, wait a minute. A shotgun? Well, when I looked up here and I was, i forgotten where I see it, local resident, uh, Fort Fatalities. I was just, you know, kind of going through and I found somewhere in the text, let me find it. Uh, it's killed me attempt. Gun, uh, sorry, I'm doing this. Well, it's in here somewhere. It's in here somewhere. Uh, I don't remember where and I'm not seeing it instantly. I don't want to waste my time. It's in here somewhere that it stated that he used a rifle. Well, that's obviously not a rifle to me. That is obviously a fracking shotgun, because I know a little bit about guns, and I can tell the difference between a rifle and a shotgun, because, uh, yeah. Um, Captain Jesse asked, did it even happen for real, or is the story? No, 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 there are some facts, but you have to trace back to patient zero to find them. We're currently out somewhere, I think about, you know, maybe level one or two, you know, in terms of uh, wave one or two of the press. Uh, so these were the first guys I saw in English that had it. And, uh, you know, as I say, somewhere in this video, they talk about it being a rifle, and I'm not seeing where. 
but it caught my eye because I went, wait a minute, that's not a rifle. So I'll go into fair witness mode. Do we assume that this is actually one of the weapons used by the gunman? Or could it be something else? We don't know where this picture comes from. We have no idea where they got it. And so without knowing that, without having some kind of definitive uh, citation that we can go check out, maybe you know somebody we can go to. This comes from RT. Oh my God, it comes from RT. Okay, I don't care what you think of RT, whether you think they're a great, um, better um, news agency than uh, any of the American ones. But I do want you to know that RT is the Russian official news service. Um, they're going to be some kind of uh, uh, propagandists for Russia. So just keep that in mind. Not everything that they say and do is all wonderful and huggy-dory. And here's an example. They've got a picture of a... Uh, uh, a uh, uh, shotgun when a rifle is mentioned. Okay, so I said to myself, uh, I'm kind of curious about that. Where did that come from? Is it a rifle or is it a shotgun? So what I did was I go out and I do a Google search here. I'll just do it for you and show you what I did. I first uh, went over here and I found some keywords. Uh, let me find here. The town Keidler. I'll copy that. Drop it into Google, and then we'll say uh, shooting. So we're going to do Google, Google search for that. Make sure, make sure it's going. All right, and then we go to news, because that'll tell us a lot. Go over here to news and start looking at timings of when these released. Okay, February 18th, that was yesterday. Uh, another February 18th. Ah, 15 hours ago. These are what I like to see. Hours. How many hours ago did it happen? Well, in the case of this one, I won't scroll back through because it's been a couple of days, so it would be more difficult to find patient zero in this list. But I did find the one. I found the one that appeared to be from TASS, which is the uh, Russian news service. And uh, I put that one in to see what I got back for a story. That TASS one was earlier than the one in the Daily Sun at in Britain. So this story came before that one. So I thought, okay, could this be patient zero? Well, after reading this one for a while, <laughs> I found that there was another one. Uh, it, well, actually, if you read this one somewhere, let me find it. Well, it doesn't show it here. Uh, I think I had to go to another video, another one, that was also at TAS. So let me see if I can do a copy of this. Sorry, I have a couple of windows open. So I, I searched around TAS um, in order to see if I could maybe find what that next, you know, where did this, where did this thing with a rifle originate? Where did that, where did that happen? So I'm, I'm generally looking for a rifle here. Still not finding a reference to it. I've forgotten where I did. Um, but in any case, this was interesting because I did another type of search because I was like, oh, they think he might have some connection to Islam. Uh, okay, resolution drop and buffering. I'm probably moving the damn page too fast, so I will move it more slowly. Um, it says he has no connection to Islam. He's had, uh, says the uh, Church of uh, Chesnia. Let me see if I can find the uh, competing one. Uh, no, that's the Guardian. Uh, here's the competing article. Um, now, and remember here, we're, we're fading off into um, level two here, wave two of the press getting this story. So if we look at this new one that I found, well, and then, and I have no idea which is actually more accurate because this one comes from a site that just looking at it, I would have to say, might be predisposed to finding an ISIS thing. Um, and this one, on the other hand, comes from the Russian official news service, TASS, which means it's gone through so many different filters and censorship because that's what they do there. Always remember the info you get out of Russia is going to go through a bunch of censors at different levels. So, then I said to myself, hey, wait a minute. Um, I got closer to uh, the patient zero. 
um, patient, because the guardian I found had a slightly earlier story than either of those. So I kept working my way backwards in time. That's what you have to do with this. You work backwards and backwards until you find it. Let me find a rifle. Yes, there we are. Unknown man. And this is quoting from... Uh, I've, I'm not sure. It says, an unknown man opened fire with a hunting rifle. Okay. It weren't no... It may not have been a... Uh, may not have been a rifle. It may not have been a shotgun. We don't know. We're fair witnesses. The only thing we can say is that we see it is reported here as a rifle. We cannot know for sure that it is a rifle. We only know that it was reported here as a rifle. So, it says he was carrying a rifle and a knife. And this is by a guy named Father Pavel, uh, who was uh, apparently the uh, priest at this uh, Orthodox uh, church. Uh, they have some footage provided by MASH, which I think will MASH, I think we'll see it here or somewhere else, I've forgotten. And then, uh, what else? Telegram is ready, yeah, and showed worships running from the scene of the attack. Uh, again, that's only what it says. We cannot be sure that that's true. We're fair witnesses now. We have to look at what we see. What I can see is... Look right here. This picture they put up here. This is actually a piece of file footage. 2005. You always need to look at those. Where did they come from? Because this makes it appear that this picture is in conjunction with this story. But it's not. It's completely stock picture that they pulled out. Because they wanted to make it look good. And they wanted to make it look more interesting, more sensational than it actually was. And this is the Guardian. They came before these guys over here that came across mine. So it went, near as I can tell, it went from Tass to the Guardian in English and then into the Sun. The Sun added a bunch of stuff. Um, there were not a lot of stuff added by anybody else, and we can't see what this stuff is. We don't know. We don't know where it came from. It is totally out of context. For all we know, this could be something that happened five years ago at a totally different place. Um, the best, at best you could say, they probably may have gotten some of this footage from uh, social media. But you tell me if you think social media is necessarily a really really great place to go for accurate information you know basically it's a bunch of different witnesses who have all had time to think about it and talk about it five million times before they write it down and the moment a witness does that you have no more they're not going to be telling the facts anymore they're going to be telling what they think of the facts or what they have sort of convinced themselves of the facts but that's different from what they might say the moment that it happened so Always remember, when you see this stuff, if it's from Facebook, who knows? Who knows what's going on there? Anyway, I kept searching around because uh, I wanted to uh, find out where exactly did Patient Zero come from, because it's neither of these. And so I did that Google search again to find, you know, where I could find the earliest occurrence of this story appearing on the Internet. And I found it. I found Patient Zero. This is patient, excuse me, if it'll load, <laughs> I'm going to drop this ISIS one, I suspect. I'm, I'm going to drop, yeah, I'm going to drop everybody. Well, yeah, I want to keep these two. All right. Uh, okay. Aren't you supposed to be auto? Okay. What do I have to tell you to translate? Where did it auto translate it before? All right, so this is a reasonably good English translation of uh, the story. And it originated, this is the first time we see it, at Sargrad TV. So it originated with that news outlet. And there is, uh, you know, this eyewitness account they had. It said, the man armed with a gun approached the people gathered near one of the churches in uh, Kislar. I don't know how that's pronounced, sorry. 
He opened for a fire for a defeat in the crowd. That's a bad uh, translation. <laughs> According to this, uh, he did not shot, shout uh, Allahu Akbar. He shouted it furiously all the time. Uh, yeah, did not just shout it. So, so this is why that other outlet thinks maybe ISIS was involved and maybe they did take credit for it. I do not know. But that's where we see this. And then we have another piece of footage that I, I oh man, I, I guess I could try to play. <sighs> I'm scared of this. It's only 34 seconds. And now this is where they got footage from MASH. There's no audio that I can tell on this. Watch the footage. Do not take it out of context. Do not think about what's being said in the words. Just watch the soundless footage from this thing. And don't make any assumptions about anything. So, this video that purports to show some part of the shooting, what that video actually shows is a woman looking over her shoulder, then turning and running toward the, the, where, the underside where the camera is posted. As fair witnesses, that's all we can say. There is nothing else in there that tells us anything. It's completely out of context. We don't know where it happened. It's impossible to know because they're not actually, there's, I think this guy from MASH, which means it's probably from somebody's Facebook or something, or, you know, who the hell knows. We don't know where it came from. For all we know, this could be something that happened 10 years ago and has nothing to do with this. We have no way of knowing. So that particular information, completely out of context and with nothing to tell us for sure what it is. Forget about it. It's irrelevant. We can throw it away. Uh, similarly, I suspect this picture, yes, this picture is from globallookpress.com. That means that this picture is file putted, file picture. It's not a picture they took at the site. So ignore that. So let's look just at the story. And that's where we really want to get down to with patient zero, because I think patient zero here has probably the most uh, accurate information. And they're saying, in Kislar, uh, Kizyar, God, I can't see if it's a, a 22-year-old man opened fire at the parishioners of the temple. Uh, according to, the, again, remember, this is translated by Google Translate, so it's OK. We can understand what it is, but there are some things that are going to sound weird. According to the preliminary version, he prepared the attack together with his wife. Keep that in mind. They're saying he did it with his wife. In Degestan's Kizlar, a 22-year-old man opened fire on the prisoners of the St. George's Church. As a result of the attack, four people were killed. At least five people were injured of varying severity and are in the hospital. The man, armed with a gun, approached the people uh, gathered near one of the churches in Kizlar. He opened fire uh, for defeat in the crowd, eyewitnesses tell. The bandit did not just shout Allahu Akbar, but he shouted it furiously at all times, eyewitnesses say. He also allegedly shouted the word infidels. The shooter was eliminated by the soldiers of Razgvardia, 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 who were on duty at the temple, according to the preliminary version, together with the deceased. The woman was preparing the attack. A number of eyewitnesses say that she also fired and was detained by law enforcement. However, I will tell you later versions of this, have a lot of that in question. Uh, in social networks, publish photos from the scene. According to the preliminary version, they have a shooter who opened fire on the parishioners. What that's really saying is they got a bunch of stuff from social media, you know, because that's like really, really, really something you can rely on. Yeah. Um, that's the whole story. So what we know as facts out of this, 22-year-old man, his name was later released, 22-year-old man opened fire. He was, he, his wife maybe helped him. Maybe. We don't know for sure. He may have yelled Allahu Akbar quite a lot. We don't know for sure. These are witnesses, but we don't know for sure if what they say is accurate. Witnesses will sometimes have time to let their brain put in additional details that were not present. Or if witnesses start talking to each other, one of them might say, hey, I yell, heard him yell Allahu Akbar. So he goes, yeah, I did too. He was practically yelling it the whole time, wasn't he? He yelled it to you, he yelled it to me, he told it to her, when all they're really hearing is the one 
but when they get to talking together, the story will change. So we cannot be sure about that. All we know is that he opened fire, um, the St. George Church, the place, and four people were killed, five were injured. He had a gun, they don't state what kind, and they say that uh, soldiers uh, killed him. Um, and there was ones on duty. That's all we know. That's all we know for sure. Now, a couple of other things did come out after this that I'm not putting up here that had to deal with his name and all that. Um, but this is patient zero. These are the guys that actually came up with this article. So let's compare that to the Daily Sun one, which is the one that I saw first. So uh, we get this gunman opens fire on a church festival crowd of at least five dead. The original article did not mention that it was a festival. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. We don't know. There's no way for us to tell. The original article did not mention a festival. So keep that in mind. This appears to have been added along the way. Again, we're probably into a wave two of the press here. So we're seeing things that have been added on as the story progressed. This festival thing, I searched back a little bit for it, and I'm not sure that they didn't just come up with it themselves. I have no idea. So throw that out, that festival. We don't know. Just throw it out. A uh, gunman has slaughtered at least five people uh, after opening fire on a church festival. Again, you get rid of the festival. Crowd, you can get rid of crowd. We don't know if there was a crowd there. We haven't seen a crowd. We don't know. We have no way of knowing if there was a crowd there. There are video down here when you run it. What the hell? I'll tax my computer. Um, oh, God, I can hear it. Um, let's see if I can. There, there are Russian uh, people speaking. There. Okay, they were. Let me run it back. I can tell you exactly what I'm hearing because that's all that matters here. Okay, two, two shots, select fire. Two more shots, select fire. Rifle or shotgun? Rifle or shotgun? Girls talking. No other shots. Oh wait, one shot from the sh from the rifle or shotgun. That's all we know. That's all we know. And we don't even know if that's where it took place. We have no way to know. Um, same th deal here. Uh, they have, uh, let's see, a picture that we do not know where it came from. Just says breaking uh, and then s N live winter. I, I don't know if this means this was taken by someone named N live winter, or maybe that's a, <clears throat> a service where they get file stock footage, fo photos from. I don't know. We don't know. Throw it out. Doesn't matter. This one. Okay, we can take this video and say we heard some things totally out of context. We have no context for this video at all. So keep that in mind. All we did was we heard some shots and some people talking, and that's all. So let's go back to some of the language used here in the subheadline. A gunman has slaughtered at least five people. Okay, stop right there. Slaughtered is an emotionally loaded word. Let me go on to my cam so I can talk about this for a second. Words have emotional meanings as well as just literal ones. And the only way I can give you an idea of how this uh, operates is a word in French that's very um, considered very insulting if you use it on a woman. And I happen to know because <laughs> Uh, I speak some French. I learned. I started learning it pretty early, and I have a you know, bit of an affinity for uh, France because of that, because you know, and Francophile stuff. And um, I, uh, there was there was a girl who was we were hosting for a while in Lincoln, Nebraska. She came there uh, from France, and we were hosting her. And they had some kind of party where all the kids that were, that were being hosted in Lincoln, Nebraska, and there's 15 or so of them. So they all got together for a party. I went and I brought my girlfriend, who, by the way, I will mention, looked exactly like Romana too in Doctor Who. And boy, were my geek friends really, really jealous of me. But, <laughs> oh, how's the water? Water's good. Um, but <clears throat> we were up there, and we, my girlfriend and I, and we're standing on a balcony, and we're just talking. You know, balconies like here, we're standing here talking. And 
we notice just, you know, sort of in passing that some girl is leaving with a guy. You know, big shock there. But then this girl comes screaming out onto the balcony, pushes us aside, and starts screaming down at this girl, Salope! Salope! Just at the top of her lungs, screaming Salope. Well, if you look at the literal definition of Salope, it's like slut or bitch or something like that. That's what they use as the literal version, but it's not the emotional version of that. The emotional underpinning of that is much, much worse. It's somewhere between, you know, like really sleazy, nasty, slutty girl all the way up to the C word. That's how bad that is. It's way beyond slut. You know, it's, it's over in a place that we do not have an actual literal word that means it. We don't have a word that means that, trust me. When I finally figured out what it was, it was, oh my God, we don't really have a, a word that means what that means emotionally. So you always have to remember, words have emotional meanings. So let me get back to this. They have used the word slaughtered. Slaughtered is an emotionally loaded word. It should not be used here. We want facts. We do not want sensationalism. Using the word slaughtered is sensationalism. You could say killed, and that would be that. Uh, church festival crowd, we can get rid of that. We've never seen a crowd. We do not know if there was a crowd, and there was none mentioned by patient zero. And we have our video that's out of context. We don't know what it is. We, uh, it if it's from the scene, it tells us a couple of things, that there were select fire weapons and that there were rifle or a shotgun. I could not tell from the sound because it was too muffled. My inclination is to think that it's probably a rifle given how all of the other news stories except these guys said it was a uh, rifle and they didn't show a picture and these guys said it was a rifle too. So um, anyway, uh, they, uh, yeah, this picture here again comes from some kind of service. So this did not occur on the scene. We're not even sure if it's at the location where it occurred. We got no idea. Throw it out. Doesn't matter. Then we have, let me see if I can get some actual copy here. He went on the rampage. Rampage is an emotionally loaded word. You take rampage out. Um, you might, went on the rampage is totally emotionally loaded. You need to put some language in there like, uh, let's see, he, um, he was armed, just that. He was armed with a hunting rifle in the city of Kyler, uh, in the Republic of uh, Dagestan. Okay, okay, get rid of that whole, uh, he went on the rampage and just say he was armed with. Uh, let's see, uh, Marshall saying assault weapon, assault rifle, but uh, we hear, but hearing someone uh, gunned down with an assault weapon is much more scary than hearing someone gunned down with a sporting rifle. Yes. Well, and that's what they're using here as a rifle. But they, again, they're, they're emotionally loaded words that are intentionally sensationalizing the story. Um, then he said the shooter targeted a group of people celebrating a religious folk festival and injured four others. Um, okay, we don't know that it was a religious folk festival. We were told it was a church by patient zero, that's all. Um, and then he says the shooter targeted a group of people. Well, that's not necessarily a good way to say it. It's emotionally loaded. You might say uh, the shooter... Um, injured four others or you might say uh, well like they did here it was at the, at the church that it was at we actually have the name of the church with patient zero here patient zero has the name of the church you could simply have put that in there the facts were that the shooter at such and such church injured four other people that's what you would say if you were getting rid of the emotional language Security guards killed the attacker, said to be a local resident, born in 1995, but two of them were, one, were wounded in the process. Okay, that's actually factual. I believe the guy was 22, and so uh, I think one of the other stories, the later ones from TAS, did give out you know, his age and his name and how, when he was born. So I think that's an accurate uh, crib from TAS. Uh, the four fatalities are reportedly uh, five uh, fem female children who are leaving a, a, an Orthodox Sunday service. Uh, I've never seen this. I, I don't. This was the first time that that's been mentioned. I did not see it in any of the stuff out of TAS or Patient Zero or a couple of the others because I looked. We can't say for certain that they were that they were female civilians, and we cannot say for certain 
they were having an Orthodox uh, when they were that they were leaving the Sunday service. We cannot be certain of that. We have never been told that anywhere that was anything like factual. We are off into, as I say, you know, two or three waves, and we're starting to get stuff just added. So again, ignore the ignore the picture. Uh, it's irrelevant. An eyewitness said churchgoers were able to take cover inside the building. Well, this is the first time we've heard that. I have not heard that anywhere before. She said there were a lot of people there, moms with little children, elderly people. I believe God saved us, uh, not knowing, not allowing the men to get inside the church. Uh, she said the attacker was killed as he attempted to escape. Okay, where did they get that from? Where did that particular whole um, paragraph come from? I have not seen that mentioned anywhere before. At best, they're getting it from Facebook. And that's really, really not very, some, you can't rely on that. As I say, people start talking, even to other people. They're going to, you know, think up sometimes stuff that didn't happen. They believe it happened, but it didn't. Uh, here and now we have this picture. I have to look and see where that comes from. It was RT. It comes from RT. They may have picked this up from RT when they did this story. I didn't look and see what RT did. But again, we're not seeing a rifle here. We're clearly seeing a shotgun. We're clearly seeing a shotgun shell. This picture has nothing to do with this absolute this story whatsoever. Ignore this picture. It has nothing to do with this story. Marshall says, this is a class escape uh, connection versus uh, denotation. Good journalists should avoid the first and stick to the second. There are no good journalists. They don't do that. Uh, this is how this echo chamber works, and we're off into roughly two or maybe three uh, waves here. So, the gunman was said to be with his wife, who fled before the shooting started, and uh, has now been detained. Okay, that ain't what the Russians were saying at the time I was looking at Tass. They weren't even saying for sure that there was a second person. They took that, this is TASS, right? This is the, so, the I'm Soviet, I'm sorry, the Russian official news service. They took that story from Patient Zero and they took out the part about there being his wife involved. They removed it completely. And they did that because they then came out with a story that said this man had nothing to do with Islam. So what they're trying to do here is keep some kind of Islamic war from breaking out like much of the world is trying to do right now. So <clears throat> they pulled it. You had to get that information from Patient Zero. It was not anywhere else. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad they picked that up from somewhere. Harrowing pictures from the scene show police officers standing next to the victims. We haven't seen any of these pictures before. This is the very first time that any of this has appeared here in this in any news source. I looked around. This is all a first. These are the guys that put these out here on the internet for the first time. We do not know anything about these pictures. We don't know where they got them. We don't know if they're actually by someone who was there. We don't know if they're just inserted to make it more sensational and therefore sell more advertising. Because, boys and girls, that is a journalist's main function, to sell advertising. And uh, it says the attacker can be heard uh, opening in the uh, disturbing footage. Well, the disturbing footage, uh, opening fire in the disturbing footage, yeah. Now, again, we have some pictures here that say they're at the scene, but guess what? This picture is from RT and therefore instantly suspect. Cross it off your list. It isn't relevant. And so we are at the end of the article. Oh, I guess we're not. They put in a center section here of the worst shootings in history that you can walk through. Yeah, let's, let's sensationalize it just a little bit, shall we? Moving on to the tiny final remainder of this article. Russia's interior ministry issued this statement at about 16.30 p.m., which is 13.30 p.m. GMT. An unknown man opened fire using a hunting rifle. As a result, four people were killed and four injured. Among the wounded are two members of the security forces. The gunman was killed. And then uh, Dagestan is a largely Muslim federal republic and has witnessed ethnic tensions since the 1990s. So again, uh, they're getting a uh, you know a statement out of the Russians. You know the guys who didn't 
tell, talk about the wife that took that out for the official stories and all that. So, uh, you know, I'm not even sure where this is, uh, where, where some of this is coming from. I, I assume that if I looked hard, I would find the interior ministry with a statement. I did look around and there were some interior stuff with statements, but they really didn't tell us much of anything. So, now we have ejected anything audiovisual in this story except for the video at the top and that only to say it's totally out of context. However, what we can hear in it is useful information, assuming that it actually happened there. So as a fair witness, all I can say is I heard firing. I heard specific firing. I believe if I remember it was two shots of select fire, another two shots of select fire, and then three shots of, uh, of uh, some kind of rifle or shotgun, and that's all. That's all I know. That's all a fair witness knows. And we don't even know where that took place. Uh, something still sounds fishy with the story? No, no, I don't think it's fishy at all. I think we're just about off into uh, the last round, the last wave, which is going to be where me and uh, other commentary people talk about this stuff. But we're sitting off in the last wave on that. The problem is we now have, if, we, if you took this story seriously, you know, if you said, if you believed everything that was on this, you've just been pulled into a lot of sensationalism and a lot of crap and a lot of pictures from a news source, RT, that is on the face of it untrustworthy. So we have to throw out all those pictures. We have to throw out about 90% of what this says. The real story here, the only information that we really have out of all of this stuff is that this guy had a gun, a rifle. That's it. Everybody seems to agree he had a rifle. But again, being a fair witness, we have to say to ourselves, okay, that's what people are saying. We're going to put that in the back. I'm not really going to take it too seriously because that's what people are saying. We weren't there. We didn't see it. But what I do is I kind of go through the news articles and I see where at least basic points tend to match up. So I'm going to assume for the sake of argument, there was a guy. He had a rifle. He killed five people, injured four others at a specific church at a specific time of day. And, you know, the who, what, where, and why. He may have had a female accomplice who was his wife. That accomplice may be in custody. And beyond that, we know nothing. That, out of all that that I just read you and all the backstory and the digging and going down the rabbit hole that I had to go down in order to find this patient zero and then determine, oh my God, all these details have been added and added and added and added, unsurprisingly, uh, as the echo chamber starts to quote itself. That's what they do a lot of the time. The echo chamber starts to just quote itself. And then finally, when you get to commentaries, commentaries on this, and I don't know if Rush Limbaugh has touched it, feel free to listen to him and see. The moment that he starts talking about that thing, remember that he's getting news from sources that are totally unreliable. He has no idea if things went down the way that he said. Same with Alex Jones. He's getting the news from places that he has no idea if they're accurate or not. The thing is, I have seen stuff consistently throughout my life. I have worked with the press since I was 15 years old. And the first time that I worked with them, they asked if they would change a quote of mine because it was too controversial. That was the first time that I sort of figured out, hey, wait a minute, these guys are not telling the truth sometimes. And then I got to uh, meet Deborah Winger. I've told the story elsewhere, but um, I, uh, I met Deborah Winger uh, when they filmed Terms of Endearment in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I was going to school as a theater major. So unsurprisingly, myself and one other friend of mine, we forged uh, press credentials from some no and um, impossible to find college out in western Nebraska. and. <laughs> We, uh, we went in into, into the press briefing. Now, you have to understand what happened was she hit the ground in Lincoln. They stuck her in a limousine. They drove her to the hotel. They pushed her into, you know, this ballroom, and that's that. that, that that's all of what she's done so far, the moment she got to Lincoln. <laughs> done. 
So the press is asking the usual stupid questions. My friend and I are kind of, you know, smirking to ourselves that we're there, you know. And, and um, somebody asks her, what do you think you're going to do here in Lincoln when you're not shooting? Oh, God. See, entertainers have pretty pat answers for stuff like this. They get it all the time. And it gets into what in wrestling, pro wrestling used to be called cheap heat. If you wanted to make people hate you really quickly, if you were in some other town or city than you usually were in, just call them names because they live there. That's cheap heat, right? <laughs> um, oh, man, where was I at with this? I just lost my train of thought. Well, boys and girls, that's what happens. Um, oh, the Deborah Winger story. Thank God I remembered. Okay, <laughs> so they develop pat answers for this, right? And with the pat answers are usually stuff like, well, you know, I didn't really see much of the city as I was driving through, but it really looked beautiful, and, you know, everybody's been really friendly and nice, and I really can't wait to go out and explore. And then you aim yourself at the biggest camera that you can find, and you say, who wants to show me around? And that's what they always say, and they say it for a reason because that's not what Deborah Winger said. Uh, fair witness, I'm just quick here with Marshall, fair witness uh, would say they heard something that resembled a small caliber single shots and, and something that resembled shotgun reports. They wouldn't assume gunshots. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. My opinion there is tainted by the fact that this is presented as a, uh, a murder. And so I, I'm in, I, I am far too inclined to believe the words on the page. It is a problem. You, you can't avoid it. The best you can do is maybe get back to patient zero. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I'm not a fair witness. I don't claim to be. I just try to put myself in that mode. But Marshall's exactly right. So anyway, what uh, Deborah Winger did was when they asked her, you know, remember now, she's in Lincoln, Nebraska, right? She's from Hollywood. She's in Lincoln, Nebraska, which had at that time a population of about 150,000. So she's asked what she's going to do when she's not shooting. She hasn't seen anything of Lincoln. She assumes it's a pretty small town, right? And so she says, I don't know. Is there anything to do? Oh, God. Big, 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 big mistake. You have no idea what happened after that. The next day, every single press outlet in the uh, state ran banner stories about how she was this huge slut and she'd hit on everybody because there was a reception afterwards and she was a drunken whore. And they all did it. They all made it completely up. And I know they made it completely up because I went to the uh, reception afterwards and I met her. I shook her hand and practically had to stop myself from recoiling when I realized that when the camera adds 10 pounds, that means if a person looks normal on camera, that means they're skinny as a rail. And boy, was she. It, 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 shaking your hand was like shaking skin and bones. I'm not kidding. It was like shaking, uh, I don't know, my great-grandmother's hand. It was just, uh, I really was like, nice to meet you, Miss Winger. I really enjoyed some of the work you've done. I, and I was like, oh, man, what do I do with this? I, keep, I literally had to keep myself from shivering. So anyway, I was talking to her. She had had something to drink on the plane. There was no question about that. But she was just buzzed. She, she wasn't, you know, doing jello shots. She wasn't hitting on everybody. That was a complete lie. What she'd done is offered them an opening by saying intimating that Lincoln was too small to have something to do when she's not shooting, which it wasn't, by the way. She was insulting Lincoln, and by extension, the entire state of Nebraska, and so the gloves came off. They just came off, and they made up all this stuff about her. And that was the second time. Later on, I was doing some summer stock work along the Mississippi. And uh, I got interviewed by the local paper. They did this all summer. They would go through and interview either actors or some of the people behind the scenes and so forth. And they would make a basically a one or two page spread. I've forgotten about that. Just did a human interest piece. Well, we were warned that the uh, interviewer, the reporter who was going to interview us, had something against the theater for some reason. So be careful what you say because she's going to twist it around. 
Well, I got into my interview, and I thought I was careful with what I said, but no, she completely twisted it around. I wish I still had the, uh, the newspaper clipping, because I was like, what? how do you get that out of what I said? You know, it was, it, it, was, it was taking things out of context. It was making things up. They do that a lot, by the way. They make up quotes. I'll tell you another one about that in a second. But no, she wrote a hit piece just because... That's what they do at that paper. She writes hit pieces for reasons that no one even knows. Uh, that's one piece of the press. Then there was a time that I did the, um, the uh, Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, I was involved in a thing where I was trying to do some stuff with the city council, uh, one of the city councils where I lived in Chicagoland, uh, to get them to not annex some land. Um, <laughs> I was against that for a number of reasons, but the upshot was I was interviewed afterwards by the Chicago Sun-Times, and that reporter went back and she made a, she was very much on our side, beside the people who didn't want this to happen. And she went back and she wrote a, uh, an amazing article where she quoted me saying things that I had never in a million years thought about saying. I, I opened it up, I took it to my wife, now my ex, and I said, yeah. This is a nice article, but I didn't say that. I kind of wish I had, but I didn't. She just made it up. What I said wasn't interesting enough, so she made it up. Just made it up. Um, I kept having deals with that like over and over and over, and they're pretty easy to figure out, actually. It's pretty easy to figure out. See, they're not just assigned a story. They're assigned some kind of angle. I don't know if they still call it an angle, but when I was doing any level of journalism, they called it an angle, and that's a point of view. What point of view are you going to take on this story to make it more interesting? Or to make it hopefully more truthful, but usually more interesting? Never forget, these guys' jobs is to sell advertising. That's why they're there, to sell advertising. So, um, God, I've lost my place again. <laughs> Uh, that's what happens when you do it live, boys and girls. That happens when you do it live. Well, I guess let me check my time real quick here. 10.07. That's good. That's good. Hey, great. Um, all I can tell you is that this happens over and over and over and over. It is every single thing that you see in your paper, your local paper, everything that you see there, even if it's just a cat getting taken out of, caught in a tree. Trust me, they blew it along the way somewhere. They always blow it. They never get it right. Oh, they have an angle. That's why they're easy. They're actually easy to manipulate. And this is how Trump does it, by the way. This is part of how he does it. Reporters are never signed just a story. They're assigned an angle. What point of view is this? How are we going to push this? Okay. Right from there, you're saying the reporter is not going to be dispassionate. A reporter is going to have this angle. And they have to write to that angle. Because if they don't, their editor is not going to run their story. And if the editor doesn't run their story very often, they're out of, the job, out of a job. So here's how you do it. You get with them. And before you even open your mouth about anything, you just say these words. What's your angle? And they tell you. They will tell you because they want help with it. So what you then do is in order to get your word out, is you phrase everything you're talking about and saying in a way that supports that angle. Then you get a good story about you. Now, if you're, if you're not that smart, uh, what happens is the reporter comes out with their angle and they start interviewing people. Hopefully they find some people that'll support the angle. But if they don't, they just throw them out and forget about them. Then they'll maybe interview you know, other people. They keep trying to get something that's at least close to the angle. They eventually got down to their deadline, and so they're like, okay, fine, I'll take any freaking quote I can get. These guys who don't want it, we'll call them hostile. You know, we'll call them hostile to this or whatever. You know, hostile, because it's my angle. And then they make crap up that supports their angle. That is what they all do. This notion of journalistic integrity has never been accurate. All you need to do is go back to the beginning of the last century and look up, um, God, now I'm blanking on his name. He's the guy that uh, uh, was uh, uses a character basis in Citizen Kane. 
William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst, who was one of the um, first real newspaper magnets, guy who controlled a lot of newspapers around the country. You know, uh, you think we have those problems with corporations owning a lot of stuff? He owned a lot of stuff. Nothing like what Disney owns, but he owned a lot of stuff. And he became extraordinarily wealthy off of it. Um, so look back at him. He was not about the truth. He never has been about the truth. Neither has the press ever been about the truth. It's about making something look good or something look bad, mostly so they can get more advertising dollars. And then we get to their own political viewpoints, because they clearly have them. I can walk through any news story and just eliminate the emotional language and show how A, there's little fact in there, and B, the emotional language is actually designed to make you feel a certain way about this story and their angle. It is insidious what they do, especially now that they're extraordinarily politicized. They have all, in my lifetime, in my entire lifetime, there has never been a time when the press was not extraordinarily polarized and in favor of Democrats, every single last one of them with a few exceptions. We now have Fox News, but I'm unclear that they're any different. They're just cheerleading the other side. They're not giving you facts. They're just cheerleading the other side. And so we're still not getting, we're not getting any facts out of this. Nothing in there is real. It's just not. You, you might have a glimmering of what actually happened in there, but most of it you can just throw away. You can just throw away. That whole Sun article that I showed you boils down to 22-year-old guy, whose name was released later, I don't remember what it was, uh, killed five people, injured four others at a church in this place in Russia. You can name the church and you can name the place because they're out there. He may have had a female accomplice who may or may not be in custody. And that, boys and girls, is all we actually know. And we don't even know that for sure. We're, I'm just assuming that Patient Zero was writing more or less what he figured out at the time. Probably added some stuff to it, because they always do. But um, at least Patient Zero is closest to where the facts might be. So that is how I do it. Um, that is what I do with every single news article I see. Tell you what, let me go up here. I'm going to do something real quick. Uh, God, why am I blanking on this? Let me just find a... Let's remind, I'll find an article out of my RSS feed. I just totally uh, uh, random. I'm going to scroll down up a few times. Click. <sighs> Trump endorses Romney again. Okay. Didn't really want to get a political one, but let's see what we can do. Oh, good. This is wonderful. This is from Reuters. Reuters is supposed to be <laughs> one of the premier news agencies in the world, boys and girls, and they do exactly the same damn thing. <laughs> All right, let's watch through here and see what Reuters has to say. Uh, headline, Trump endorses Romney in run for U.S. Senate in Utah. Uh, I happen to have seen other things about this in advance, so I know that that is an accurate statement. He did. Washington Reuters. President Donald Trump on Monday endorsed former Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney's run for U.S. Senate seat in Utah, despite Romney being often critical of Trump. Uh, that is a true statement. Uh, then we have a picture here that says former that the uh, thing says former U.S. Uh, presidential candidate Mitt Romney uh, speaks at the Utah County Republican Party uh, Lincoln Day dinner in Provo, Utah. Wow, Provo. Uh, U.S. February 16th, 2018. Okay, okay, great, 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 great. We love this, we love this. Oh, I should put this up. Uh, we love this because they actually did cite where the thing came from. We can say to ourselves, okay, we have a citation. This picture might, oops, wrong one. Oh, great, now I've got the wrong. All right, hang on a second, got to fix what me window you're seeing. Where is, no, sorry, I'm trying to get the picture back, it didn't, uh, no, that's YouTube, Trump, there we go, okay, so what you're seeing here in this picture is nicely cited for us, we can have some confidence that this actually did occur at the place and the time that they said it did. 
So yay for uh, Reuters. I think they may actually have something here. Oh, there's nothing new. No, I'm just walking through this so I can show you where the emotionally loaded language and stuff comes in. During the pre 2016 presidential campaign, Romney excoriated Trump as a fraud who was playing the American people for suckers. Trump responded that Romney had choked like a dog in his 2012 campaign against President Barack Obama. This is actually very accurate statements. Uh, excoriated is an emotionally loaded word. Uh, we might take that out and put something else in uh, that said Romney said that Trump was a fraud, etc. That is an emotionally loaded word that we would take out of there because it is, it is leading you towards an emotional conclusion. Uh, Trump responded that Romney had choked on his 2012. Okay, so the rest of that is pretty accurate. Trump said on Twitter that Romney, quote, will make a great senator and worthy successor to Orrin Hatch and has my full support and endorsement. Romney announced Friday he would run to replace retiring Senator Orrin Hatch. I believe those are accurate statements. Let me see if there's anything emotionally loaded in there. Nope, looks that like good. Romney thanked Trump for the endorsements in a tweet posted soon after the president's statement. I hope that uh, over the course of the campaign, I earned the support and endorsement of the people of Utah, he said. Okay, thanked him. I'm not seeing any emotionally little language in there. Despite Romney's prior criticism that uh, after Trump won the presidency in November 2016, he briefly considered picking Romney as Secretary of State. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an accurate statement or not. I know it's been said a lot, but I don't know if that's accurate. I don't know if that's accurate. Uh, I would have to go back on that one. You would have to go back and you'd have to find patient zero. Who said that originally? And was it someone who was actually in White House at the time? You see, one of the many things that they do with this particular thing, and they have a lot of leakers inside the White House. They have fewer now than when Trump started, but he ha they have a lot of leakers. A lot of these leakers are spooks, spies, FBI, CIA, who knows what else, NSA. So a lot of these spooks are spy. These, uh, these leakers are spooks. And they'll go to the tier one, you know, wave one people, right? And then they'll feed them stories about, hey, he was thinking about picking Romney, or hey, he was thinking about doing that. And they'll always uh, mention those sources as an unnamed source or a source close to, and the moment you see that, throw out everything that has to do with the information that they got from those sources. Those sources are very likely spies who have their own agenda and as a moment it happens to coincide with the presses which is to get rid of President Trump. And so they are you know handing them uh, information that may or may not be true but is intended to have some kind of emotional impact on the populace. So anytime you see Unnamed sources, sources close to the, check it all out. Anything those sources did or said, throw it all out. It's probably not true. And if it is, it's spun. So just throw it all out. Ah, uh, back up to the story. Uh, Republicans hold 51 of the Senate seats, but many legislative issues uh, require getting the support of 60 senators. This is true. Uh, Trump has repeatedly said that he needs more Republicans elected during the 2018 uh, congressional elections to win approval of more of his agenda. That is also a true statement. Uh, Romney said last week he generally approved of Trump's agenda, but would not hesitate to call out the president if needed. Uh, let's see. I, uh, hmm. I think that's some kind of summarization. There is no quote in there. We don't know if Romney actually said that or not. They don't say where they heard it. However, they do have a quote down here. I'm with the president's domestic policy agenda of low taxes, low regulations, smaller government pushing back against the bureaucrats, Romney said. I'm not always with the president on what he might say or do, and if that happens, I'll call him like I see him, the way I have in the past. So this is a summarization of the next uh, paragraph. Um, would not hesitate is used here. That's emotionally loaded. Let's see if he says anything like that. If that happens, I'll call him like I see him. Uh, that does not necessarily indicate that he would not hesitate to call out the president. That is emotionally loaded language intending to make you feel a certain way about this uh, event. And so we would have to take that out of there. 
Uh, it is not supported by the quote. A little farther, Trump had lobbied Hatch to run for re-election in 2018 in what was viewed as an effort to prevent Romney from getting into the Senate. Okay, stop right there. We don't know that for sure. We have no idea if that's accurate. We have no idea. We would have to trace that back to some kind of patient zero. We have no idea if that happened. It might have been something that happened behind closed doors and was leaked by spooks in such a way that it would uh, have some this impact because they're saying they wanted to keep Romney, Romney from running. So we don't know if that happened. We have no idea. Throw it out. We don't know. Trump and Romney spoke in January after Hatch announced his retirement. A White House official said, oh, we got one right there. A White House official. No name, no corroboration, a completely... We don't know anything about this White House official. We have no idea if anything they're saying is credible. We can now get rid of this entire paragraph. This entire paragraph comes from a White, a White House official, quote unquote. Forget it. The paragraph is now ejectable. We don't know if that's accurate information. Romney, the son of former Michigan, Michigan Governor Romney, helped uh, found the buyout from Bain Capital and uh, gained prominence after stepping in to lead the organizing committee for the 2002 Salt Lake City Winter Olympics after a bribery scandal. Uh, <laughs> um, let me see here. Uh, um, four years later, Romney won the nomination. Was defeated. Wow, man. Um, let's see. Bribery scandal. Um, I'd have to look that up. I, I think maybe it happened. Uh, it's interesting that they'd put it there where they did at the end of the thing because putting it at the end of that sentence is intended to say uh, he did some good things and then there was a bribery scandal. So, you know. Uh, he served as governor from Massachusetts from 2003 to 2007. That's an accurate statement. Romney sought, uh, uh, the first sought the presidency in 2008, but lost to Republican nomination uh, to Arizona Senator John McCain. Uh, that is a, um, that's an accurate statement. Yeah. Four years later, Romney won the party's nomination, but was defeated by incumbent Democrat uh, pres President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, yes, that's an accurate statement. And then the reporting's in there. So this is, this is the premier, one of the premier news organizations in, uh, in the world. Um, if you look them up, man, uh, Reuters has always had a great reputation. Uh, and, and it's reasonably good. It has a fair number of what I assume to be factual statements. I was not there when some of this stuff happened. Uh, I have seen some videos of it, so we can say I think they're making a fair number of facts in there. But even with that, they had emotionally loaded language. They had uh, facts from an unknown source, so you pitch that out. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on there. Just the little things, like the emotionally loaded language, where they put that bribery scandal in relation to everything else. This is propaganda. This is propaganda. When they do that sort of thing, put in emotionally loaded language and move things around so that it looks bad for somebody, that's propaganda. Because, see, here's the deal. If they were really just reporting the facts, it would come off like a report. It would be so boring and short most of the time. It would be little blurbs like that Russian one. There's so little facts there. I can fit that into two to three paragraphs tops. And that's what we actually know. Everything else, forget it. It's irrelevant. It either didn't happen, we can't tell if it happened, have no way of knowing if it happened. Those few facts are all we know. And then this one here. Like I say, they're using more emotionally lang loaded language. They do that a lot. There's a ton of emotionally loaded language. Here's a perfect one that just drives me insane. Every single time there's a presidential election, every single second to third tier news organization starts calling it the battle for the White House. And they put up a big graphic like that, and it's all real slick, and they talk about, yeah, see, this was tonight. He, we, get the, we get the presidential uh, debates. 
Uh, Romney battles uh, you know, Barack Obama in a fight to the finish. You know, I mean, it's it's almost like that. It is almost like that. This is sensationalism. See, if they were just reporting the facts, they'd have a guy like me sitting in a table with a fairly bland background behind them, and he would just tell you, yes, we have the presidential debates this evening. It will be between Mitt Romney and President uh, Barack Obama. Mitt, uh, Mitt Romney is the Republican, and Barack Obama is the Democrat, and they're both seeking the presidency. They're vice presidential, et cetera. You, that would be the news. That's all it would be. It would not be the war for the White House. It would be just, we have an election. And that is part of the way that they throw out no hope to people that I've talked before, and part of the way they control how people feel about this stuff. It is an election. It is not a battle. It is an election. By calling it a battle consistently over the course of many, many years, calling elections battles means that we too have two sides that are having existential, having an existential conflict. These two sides are warring. See, so it's no longer about the politics and the voting. It's about a war. And in a war, anything is appropriate. It doesn't matter what it is. In war, anything is appropriate. So now we, what a shock. We have an entirely divided country that literally does believe, at least one side, that they should go to war with the other. And the other side is no hell of a lot better. But by the press constantly doing that, it has changed the face of the American electorate. I invite you to go back and look at some of the uh, coverage of uh, 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 presidential debates that started to be televised in the 50s and the 60s. They're all on YouTube. Go back and watch them. And look how boring Walter Cronkite looks. Um, some of the time they're in uh, hot places. Cronkite will be wearing a white shirt and a tie, and he'll be utterly bland. Um, Walter Cronkite was a fairly big liberal, but he was at one time considered the, uh, the uh, most trusted man in America um, because he was capable of generally being relatively objective. None of them are objective at all now, ever. They never, ever, 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 ever are. Never assume that you have an objective reporter because they do not exist. There is no such thing. They might exist in college uh, journalism um, uh, majors. But once they get out into the real world, that's all thrown out. All thrown out completely. Control the emotions, Marshall says, and uh, their information, and you can control their decisions. That's the real key to power in the United States right now. Yes, it's, uh, it's always the key to power. Uh, I'm reminded of something that Gene Roddenberry said during his, just to get it back to, um, you know, a little Star Trek. Uh, I'm reminded of something that Gene Roddenberry uh, used to say when he was making a living doing lecture tours, which was, um, the key to ultimate power in this world is and has always been the control and manipulation of minds. That uh, right there sums it all right up. Roddenberry wasn't a great writer, but by God he could come up with some interesting ideas, and he was right. The key to ultimate power is the control and manipulation of minds, and our press is trying to do that. Some of the alternative press is no better. Please, for God's sake, turn off Alex Jones. The man is a charlatan. I can prove it nine different ways from Sunday. Stop listening to him. He's an idiot. Uh, Bill, you are in danger of uh, running over time. Yes, I know. I know I'm going to run over, but hey, what do you do? Sometimes this crap happens. <laughs> but again, we're doing a lot of controlling. Uh, it's just as bad in Canada every time there's an election. Yeah, it's pretty much that way all the time anymore. Uh, part of the no hope tends to vote out to stale parties more than uh, turning in parties. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I just look at it and I go, I can see what these guys are doing. You know, pull back as much as you can. Try to be fair witness mode as much as you can. Look really critically at what you're seeing. And say to yourself, where does this video come from? How do I know that it actually is what it says it is? 
and what can I see and hear in that video? Not what somebody told me it was. What can I personally see and hear in that video? And then you can evaluate whether or not the video is any good. Maybe if it's cited well. You need something that's cited well because someone citing it well means that you can go back and find the people that actually took the footage on the scene. Theoretically, anyway. Always look and see if anything is cited. If there's a video, ignore everything they say about what the video is. What can you see? What can you hear in the video? And as Marshall mentioned, don't make assumptions like I was doing about the caliber because I could hear it and I thought it would be, I, I, I thought it was this kind of clip. No, you would have to say you heard two shots that sounded like this and three more that sounded like this. And if you were really being a good witness, you could actually say exactly how much time occurred between each of the shots. <laughs> I really wish they'd open a fair witness training for a center. I'd be the first guy to show up. But you have to do that always with the press. Be very critical. Don't assume anything that they're saying is true. Look for emotionally loaded language. You know, when you see stuff like war for the White House, when you see, you know, battle, when you see them saying some, that the uh, candidate or somebody or other in a news article, it doesn't even have to be. I did one a while back for a local article here in uh, on Des Moines Register, which was no better. You have to look and say how much of this language they're using is just emotional because there's no way to know if their description of that emotion is accurate. You know, um, you could say, uh, a bunch of people fled in terror. Well, how do you know they were in terror? How do you know they were fleeing? All you could really say is, you saw people running away from something. You could say if they were screaming, that they were screaming. You don't know what's going on in their head. You don't know if they were in terror or if they were just really mad, you know? Um, Maybe some of them had been in the military and weren't all that terrified and were doing things like seeking cover and maybe going to try to help the injured. And There's all kinds of things you can't know. You can't look into somebody's head. So anytime you see something like that, throw it out. Just look at it and say, okay, they ran away from something. They were screaming. That is all you have for a fact. Everything else, emotionally loaded language that may or may not be accurate. You have no way of knowing. Um, get, Jesse says, you, a good thing uh, that I do not work in the new press because I find their world to, uh, too uh, innocent to get fired. Well, I, I could never work in the press. I'm not even pretending to be anything like a journalist. Please don't assume that I am. What I am is very, very hypercritical all the time about everything. And because journalism crosses over enough into the theater side of things, I can see when they're doing stuff like that emotionally loaded language. I mean, when you study theater, you're studying language a lot. You know, what does this word, how, what is the emotional meaning of this word? Am I trying to portray that or am I trying to say somebody, hey, you know, it was like this for me, you know, something like that. So you look at the words on the page and you see what those words mean exactly and what emotions those words are trying to convey. You have to do the same thing with the press. Look at the words, look at what they mean, and see if they're actually supported by what the facts are. If they use a word that's emotionally loaded, just throw it out, find something that isn't. What generally happens is you have a nice big article like one of these, it's seven or eight paragraphs long, and you find there's really only two or three paragraphs at best of real facts. Most of the time, uh, the press is uh, free associating, just free associating. The 24-hour news channels are just free associating. The news stories that they get have never been checked for facts. They're off into wave three, you know, uh, of, the, of the press thing. So it doesn't bear much relationship to reality anymore because too many things have been added that can't be corroborated. <sighs> okay. It's just down there. Nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. And I know that's a real quote because I put it on my IMDb page. Nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, be critical. Be incredible critical. Be really, really critical. Don't assume anything is right. Don't assume anything that they say is corroborated by facts. They're coming at a story with an angle, and they will always and forever twist the story around largely to meet the angle. Sometimes the angle is just to be sensationalistic. There are very many newspapers. I don't even know whether the Sun, which is where I got this, I don't even know if that's a reputable paper in Britain. 
You know, just because it gets a play out in the U.S. doesn't mean it isn't a tabloid hack sheet. So you have to be critical. You can't assume anything, not a word of what's been spoken, is actually real. You have to walk through everything and find what's not real and check it out. When you do, you're going to find the news is pretty damn boring. <laughs> So that's all the time we have today, boys and girls. Tune in tomorrow because I'm doing a review of a weird little number. I had intended to do a different review, but I'm going to throw that out someplace. The next bunch of Tuesdays, uh, not every Tuesday, but a bunch of them through the rest of the year, I'm going to be doing reviews of movies that were that have some kind of uh, a, a um, an anniversary. So, for example, when Superman, the anniversary 40th of Superman comes around, I'm doing that. Um, there are a number of movies that hit their 40th this year that I will be doing in that Tuesday time slot, uh, that uh, retro review thing, um, because I think some of them are big and, and definitely worth talking about. Um, some of them are even a little obscure and weird, but you'd be surprised. Like 1978 was a pretty big m year for science fiction. 1968, oh, God, you're going to get the review of 2001 A Space Odyssey on its anniversary. 1968 also had Planet of the Apes, which you will also see a review for on his anniversary. So I've got a bunch of those coming up this year. Um, anything that was 58, 68, 78, really, I'm going with those. Um, those are my sort of my time period where I've carved out my little niche. Um, the other stuff that comes after in the 80s, it's already pretty well documented. I don't think there's anybody that needs to tell you what it was like. Um, but before then, yeah, I'm going to do these retros. Um, the 2001 one, if you are not aware of my general feelings about that and where that comes from, is going to be a complete surprise to you. A complete surprise. Uh, Bill, I would like to uh, hear your uh, critical point of view on the Bible. <clears throat> I have none. It is a uh, book for the faithful. I do not have any criticism in that regard because you're dealing with uh, belief systems and uh, there's, there's no way to be very critical of it, I guess. It is a, it is a holy book. Um, being critical, too critical of holy books, is in my mind kind of pointless because what you're actually doing is you're kind of telling the people who believe it that, hey, wait a minute, you know, you shouldn't believe that. I don't, I don't want to get into that. I like to look at them from the perspective of what do they bring to civilization. Because I've said it before, I think Christianity as a whole, it was not an entirely new idea, but the notion of loving thy neighbor as thyself is probably the most civilizing influence that human beings have had over the course of the last 2,000 years. I think that one thing is probably more helpful in civilizing human beings. All you have to do is look back a few hundred years and my God, the atrocities they used to do and they were totally fine with. Now it is a totally different thing and I think largely because of that one precept. So I think you can look at it from a societal perspective, what's good, and, you know, what, what is the message that's delivered by these? Uh, is it something that I, it makes sense? Is it something that looks good? Does it help humanity? You know, really in a, in a, in a spiritual book, I just want to see something that helps humanity. That's why I'm a little bit more critical of Islam. Um, but in terms of Christianity, that one idea, love thy neighbor as thyself, was new enough and caught on because the Bible you know, and Christianity grew. And I think that one thing had such a civilizing influence on human beings, and I credit it a ton for that. So, anyway, all the time I got, tomorrow <laughs> I'm doing a review of The Adventures of Pluto Nash. Uh, can actually advise that, I don't know if you'd like it or not. I kind of do. It's a little guilty pleasure of mine. Every other reviewer on YouTube is going to tell you how horrible it is. And it does have some horrible stuff. But there's stuff I like in it. There's stuff I like in this movie. So I'm going to do a retro review of that tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday we start in on Star Trek uh, Continues New Voyages. I'll be doing some of the uh, vignettes and the first episode. And then on Thursday, I'm not sure, probably Thorium again. Uh, this one I did just because I, oh my God, I just did this thing. Uh, but probably Thorium again on Thursday. 
So that's all the time we have today, boys and girls. Tune in again tomorrow where I'm live Monday uh, through uh, uh, Thursday at 10 Eastern, 9 Central, 8 Mountain, 7 Pacific. And if you're working off of UTC, it is 3 a.m. the next day. Until then, this is Tales from SYL Ranch, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where all your towels are. <laughs> and I'm your host, Bill Stone. Pleasure to meet me. On, the battle between pretty evil. Let's get it right this time. And pretty good. Oh, yeah, look at that. Look at me. Begins. Well, uh, we were thinking a little more uh, bubbly. Hey. Oh, yeah. Eddie Murphy. A pleasure to meet you, Pluto. You married twins, huh? No, they're not twins. I, I met the perfect woman and then I had her clone. <laughs> Which one's which? Who cares? The Adventures of Pluto Nash. Whoa! Whoa! Why don't you take these Hillary's? We appreciate you helping us out. Very cool. 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 Very cool.